Good evening. Welcome to Monday, October 23rd, 2023, Fall Special Town Meeting. Before we begin, I'd like to introduce a few folks. Over to my right, we have Scott Hood of the Select Board, Chairman, Janice Livingston, Vice Chair, and Sean Copeland, the Clerk. Sitting with them is our Town Manager, Robert Pontbrion. To my left, our Town Clerk, Susan Copeland, and sitting down in the second row on this corner is our attorney, Greg Carbo, from the firm of KP Law. I'd like to ask you all, please, to stand to recite the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Yes, thank you. I've been reminded I'd like to call the meeting to order. Thank you. Now I'll ask Susan to read the return of the warrant. Am I on? Okay. <laughs> town of Air Special Annual Fall Town Meeting Warrant. Air Shirley Regional High School Auditorium, 141 Washington Street, Air, Massachusetts, 01432. Monday, October 23rd, 2023 at 7 p.m. Commonwealth of Massachusetts, Middlesex County. Greetings. In the name of the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, you are hereby directed to notify and warn the inhabitants of the Town of Air qualified to vote in town elections and affairs to meet at the auditorium in the Air Shirley Regional High School located at 141 Washington Street, Air, Massachusetts, on Monday, the 23rd day of October, 2023, at 7 o'clock in the evening, then and there to act in the following articles. Hereof fail not and make due return of this warrant with your doings thereof to the town clerk before the date appointed for said meeting. Given under our hands this third day of October, AD 2023, Scott A. Hood, Chair, Janice L. Livingston, Vice Chair, Sean C. Copeland, Clerk. Thank you very much, Susan. I just have to finish, sorry. Uh, true copy attest, Susan E. Copeland, Town Clerk, October 5th, 2023. As directed in the foregoing warrant, I have this day posted three attested copies in three public places, one of which was the town hall, at least 14 days before said meeting, all as here and directed. Samuel A. Goodwin, Jr., Constable, October 5th, 2023. Thank you. Article one. Adoption of General, general Laws 39, subsection 23D, the Mullen Rule to see if the town will vote to accept for all boards, committees, or commi commissions holding adjudicatory hearings in the town, the provisions of General Law Chapter 39, Subsection 23D, which provide that a member of a board, committee, or commission holding an adjudicatory hearing shall not be disqualified from voting in the matter solely due to the member's absence from one session of such hearing, provided that certain conditions are met or take any action thereon or in relation thereto. Mr. Moderator. Mr. Hood. I move that the town vote to accept the provision of General Laws Chapter 39, Section 23D, as printed in the warrant and read by the moderator. Thank you, Mr. Hood. Do we have a second? Second. Thank you. Ms. Livingston. Any discussion on the article? I think we have a small presentation. Danny Ruiz, our town planner. For those of you who haven't met Danny, I introduce you to Danny Ruiz, sign out town planner. Danny, Hello. the town. <laughs> nice to meet you all. all right. uh, we can skip this since this was just read. Uh, so this is Mass General Laws, Chapter 39, Section 23DA, which is the full section of the Mullins rule adoption, notwithstanding any general or special law to the contrary upon municipal acceptance of this section for one or more types of adjudicatory hearings, a member of any municipal board, committee, or commission when holding an adjudicatory hearing shall not be disqualified from voting in that matter 
solely due to the member's absence from no more than a single session of the hearing at which testimony or other evidence is received. Before any such vote, the member shall set, certify in writing that he has examined all that he has examined all evidence received at the met, at the missed session, which evidence shall include an audio or video recording of missed sessions or transcript thereof. The written certification shall be part of the record of the hearing. Nothing in this section shall change, replace, negate, or other supersede applicable quorum requirements. All right, so what does this mean? So the adoption of the Mullins rule will allow for members on boards, committees, or commissions to, that hold adjudicatory hearings in the town of Ayr not to be disqualified particular, for any particular application due to just missing one, app, one uh, hearing. This adoption would allow the member to review the meeting minutes, uh, meeting video, and all information presented at that meeting. Once the member has reviewed all of the information, they will sign a, a form attesting that they have reviewed all necessary information to be able to participate in future meetings um, and vote as well. The Mullins rule allows for a member to miss just one meeting without being disqualified. If that member misses a second meeting, at that point the member is not allowed to vote on the particular application. The member is still allowed to participate. Why should we approve this? Uh, so members to sit on, Members that sit on these boards um, all are, vo are volunteers and have normal day lives like we all do. And the other members, um, these members volunteer their free time to help out the town on these boards. Uh, sometimes there's unforeseen con conflicts where they have to miss a, mi a meeting. And uh, sometimes they, this just can't be, um, uh, there's no way to fix that. And so this would, uh, this wouldn't penalize them for missing that one meeting. Uh, this also makes it fair for the applicant that's before the, uh, one of those boards um, so that they can have all the members participate and vote on that. Uh, this is a huge effect on applications like a special permit, which is, uh, needs a four out of five uh, vote for an approval, so a super majority. <clears throat> the adoption of the Mullins rule will also allow for applicants and members not to be penalized and still be able to do the job as a volunteer as a town of air. Any questions? Yes. Ms. Conley? Ms. Moderator, thank you. Um, I'll refer to you as Danny, since yes. Mr. Moderator did. Uh, would you define an adjudic adjudicatory board? So an adjudicatory board is a board like a select board, Conservation Commission, a uh, planning board, zoning board. So those are boards that act on a permit. There's votes for specific permits like a uh, NOI, RDA, special permits, site plan review, um, and ZBA special permits or variances. Thank you. I understand ZBA. I understand planning. I understand conservation. What about assessors? when they issue abatements? Um, I, I don't think assessors is, a, is considered a adjudicatory, but I, I, I would have to check on that. Um, Fair enough, I won't hold you to that. <laughs> I'm not sure how the selectmen fit into that because the only adjudicatory thing they would do would be with respect to dogs and abatements. So there are certain towns that have select boards that have other permits. So it's just kind of a catch all for all other towns as well. And I don't mean to belabor this. I just want to make it clear. It's not for every single town elected or appointed board. No. Only those with adjudicatory authority. That is correct. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Any other questions? Comments? Thank you. Hearing none. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? The motion carries unanimously. I'm sorry, the article carries unanimously. Thank you. Article 2. CPA Affordable Housing Trust Funding. To see if the town will vote to transfer from the Community Preservation Fund of FY 2024 balance reserve from the housing category the sum of $200,000 to the Ayer Affordable Housing Trust for the following purposes. Ayer Rental Assistance Program, 
$72,000. Administration and financial audit of the trust, $3,000. Future acquisition of affordable housing, $125,000 for a total of $200,000. Or take any action thereon or in relation thereto. Mr. Moderator. Yes, Ms. Livingston. I move that the town vote to transfer from the Community Preservation Fund, FY 2024, balance reserve from the housing category, the sum of $200,000 for the Air Affordable Housing Trust for the purposes printed in the warrant and read by the moderator. Seconded. Second. Thank you. Thank you for the second, Mr. Copeland. I think we have a short presentation. No? Thank you. Any questions on this article? Comments? Hearing none, all in favor? Aye. Opposed? The article passes unanimously. Article 3, Bylaw Amendment Chapter 130, Dogs. Absent any objections, I shall dispense with the reading of this article as it appears in the warrant. Okay. Mr. Moderator. Yes, Mr. Copeland. I move that the town vote to amend Chapter 130, Dogs, of the general bylaws of the town as printed in the warrant and read by the moderator. Seconded. Thank you, Mr. Copeland. Seconded. Thank you, Ms. Livingston. It has been seconded. I believe we have a presentation on this, Chief. Chief Gill. Okay, hi everybody, Chief Gill. Um, so this is the first of two uh, bylaw amendments that I'm uh, recommending that the Town of Air adopt. The first one we're going to talk about tonight is the uh, dog, dog bylaw, which is uh, Chapter 130 in our Rules and Regulations. Um, one, of the, uh, one of the primary goals to making this um, uh, recommendation and to adopt this is to kind of streamline our, our animal, uh, our dog bylaw, um, which really hasn't been updated in some time. One of the goals was to uh, bring it into compliance with Mass General Law by adopting the appropriate um, uh, uh, penalty structures. Um, also, uh, to update our licensing fees. Uh, right now, our licensing uh, for dogs are uh, $6 and $8. Uh, so spayed and neutered is six and not spayed and neutered is eight. Um, part, of the, part, uh, part of raising the, uh, the, the that cost is just to kind of absorb what it actually costs to make the uh, tags and, and, and process all the uh, applications that come in. Um, is this, this is what's running it here? Okay, so um, as we see up here, uh, so chapter 140, 136 um, really highlights the definitions that uh, the animal control officer falls under. Um, and it's, it's quite luminous. In our, in our original proposal, what we did was we, we kind of listed, not kind of, we listed all of the definitions that were in state law and other definitions that we wanted to have in there. Um, uh, after speaking uh, with our uh, town's attorneys, the recommendation was to uh, just ha go with a reference to the state law. That way, if the state law ever changes, we don't have to come back and make any adjustments to the, to the bylaw itself. Um, there are other, uh, there are other um, definitions that we adopted, uh, we wanted to keep in there, such as who the hearing authority is, and, uh, and in different uh, municipalities that could be different, and we wanted to make sure things like that were highlighted that were specific to AIR. Um, the other uh, parts that we wanted to do was direct uh, the residents to the chapter uh, 140-136A to 174E, and that really is all of the, 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 rule, the regulations that govern uh, the, the dogs in the Commonwealth, and uh, so that kind of really solidifies what we're talking about as uh, part of our rules and regulations. Um, what we also wanted to do was uh, really identify the uh, prohibited behaviors and responsibilities of uh, dog owners. Um, that were um, listed in, in certain areas and not in others, and they should have been. So this kind of highlights what is expected of dog owners. Um, right now, if we pick up a dog and have to take it to a kennel which is out of town, we don't recoup that expense. Um, that, that we're adding in a, uh, an ex uh, a fee for that, that if we have to pick up a dog, 
we can't find the owner and we have to take it to a kennel, then you know there is a an expense uh, there there is a fee that has to be paid by the dog owner upon uh, claiming the dog. Um, we also codified uh, the process of the nuisance and dangerous dog hearings and complaints. Um, and those are found in chapter 140, 157. This is another area, when we originally proposed this, um, we, we highlighted everything that was in the law, we just kind of copied and pasted it in there. Um, what we, uh, again, under advice uh, of our council was, why do that? Because if the law changes, then we have to go back and do the bylaw again. So what we did was we made a reference to the bylaw, uh, a reference to the, sorry, general law, and uh, and then have um, some uh, you know minor clarifications in our in the in the bylaw itself. Um, one of the things that uh, we also wanted to change was uh, rate as we as we are right now. Um, we don't start enforcing late fees until April first. So you you are required to to have your dog registered by January thirty first but we don't start enforcing until April 1st. Um, in consultation with the clerk's office, we wanted to shorten up that time frame so we could get all our affairs in order, get all of our, uh, all of our listings squared away and done. Um, and uh, we also, uh, we, we updated our fines for unlicensed and public disturbance and nuisance uh, and nuisances listed. And these are all in accordance with Mass General Law. Um, click to the next page. So these are the, um, the proposed uh, new licensing fees. Uh, so spayed and neutered are uh, $10, and again, that's up from $6. Uh, unaltered dogs, that's up from $8. Um, and then we have a new uh, category of a dangerous dog. So if the, uh, the hearing authority, which is the select board, um, deem a dog through a uh, hearing a dangerous dog, and uh, those, this happens very infrequently, but if somebody does have a dangerous dog and it's, and it's adjudicated as a dangerous dog, in order for the, uh, the owner to keep that dog in the town of air, they have to pay a licensing fee of $300. Um, we updated our fines uh, for uh, licensing late fees. That's in accordance with Mass General Law. Uh, there's our pickup fee. Um, for public disturbance and nuisance violations, uh, first offense is 50, second offense is 100, and so on as you can read. Um, and those again are in accordance with uh, the general law and a portion of our bylaws. The animal control, the, the animal, uh, the dog bylaw was never adjusted when we adjusted them in our, uh, another portion of our bylaws, which is in the uh, section one of our rules and regs. Um, and we updated our kennel fees uh, for, uh, and we just cut, we went up uh, in those slightly. So one to four dogs, 40, five to 10, 70, and 10 plus dogs, 100. And that is about it. Um, it sounds like there's a lot of change, but really we're bringing it into co uh, conformity with uh, Mass Jump Law. That is the presentation, Mr. Moderate. Thank you. Do you have questions for the chief? It's over here, please. Yes. Um, yeah, I have uh, Excuse a me. May I ask you to identify yourself and your address? Mike Gale, 34 Fletcher Street, here. Thank you. And, um, you know, we get complaints uh, that our dog um, barks um, excessively, uh, but it varies. Sometimes they're, the dog is barking at someone approaching a fence or on our property and we get calls from the animal officer saying that your dog is, uh, there's a complaint and you know, we'd like to know who's making these calls, what time um, are these calls coming in and- Thank you, I don't know that that's germane to the motion, uh, to the warrant article. I don't know, Chief, do you wanna is there something we can take out, take care I mean, of outside a, of the a, meeting? A dog uh, under the uh, 130 has a right to bark on his property or defending itself and or um, if there's something on the property, a dog has that right to bark. 
is, is there any merit when someone calls in a complaint that that would warrant an investigation? Or would that be defined as, well, that's the first offense, you get $50. Every time someone calls, okay, someone called. How is the animal officer to respond and in a timely manner um, as far as the complainant? How many times has that person been calling? And, you know, you might have to look at the person or persons who are calling. Because in the proximity of my area, there are other dogs directly across the street and behind that may, it could be that dog that's barking. But then again, my dog is the one being blamed for it. So I don't want someone to come and say, well, your dog was barking because it was a complaint. What evidence, factual evidence, would they present to the animal officer to say, yes, this is the dog that I saw and heard and I have a recording or whatever. I think but I, I believe this first, second, or third offense, you're going to have to come up with a little bit more investigative uh, technique to, to, to say that we um, have checked in the proximity of the area to make sure that it was your dog that was making this noise or any other dog. We've checked in the area to find out exactly when the complaint came in. We checked all this other to make sure that when these complaints come in and you issue that, that, uh, that fine, that it's correct because there should be some sort of appeal process afterward to where the person who um, is getting that fine, he should be able to appeal to a district court or to a higher level and then get the, uh, have a, a discovery of every, 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 all the uh, evidence that the animal officer may have obtained so we can get down and get a fair and equitable decision. Thank you. I, Mr. Moderator? Yes. Uh, so I believe I, I hear a question in there. You had a, you had a lot to say, Mr. Gellard, um, and, I'll, and I'll try and answer your question. We, we do uh, perform an investigation, which uh, sometimes includes uh, a phone call um, where we go out and we, we then begin to initiate a, an investigation. Um, and that uh, sometimes is the animal control and in the animal control's absence, uh, it would be an officer. And what we try to do at that point is uh, make any observations uh, that we can we can at that time, um, and uh, if you know there are uh, nothing that is if there's nothing that we can really see whether it's uh, whether it's one of the officers or the animal control, uh, then we try to reach out to the uh, the person that is making the complaint and find out what's happening, um, and, and we go from there. It, it does follow an investigative process. Um, and, uh, you know, we, uh, um, you know, uh, try to, you know, we, we try to do, uh, you know, follow for this the same we would do for any type of complaint that comes in. Um, and, uh, you know, and, and we have to investigate really any complaint that comes in. It would, uh, it would be inappropriate for us not to. Um, Thank you, Chief. Other questions? Ms. Nearing? Lori Nearing, Highland Avenue. Um, I had two questions, a uh, couple of clarifications, if I could, please. Sure. Um, on page five, under public disturbance, letter D, as in dog, <laughs> it seems to say that your dog is considered a public disturbance for not being spayed or neutered. Is that what that means? If it's at large, meaning running around. Okay. Okay. So if it, if it is spayed and neutered and running around, it's okay? Nope, nope, it's, uh, again, this is uh, uh, pretty much taken, this part is uh, taken out of state law, I believe. Um, that, uh, you know, being a, an unspayed female or unneutered at large is a, uh, is a nuisance. Um, and uh, I think if you read up, uh, so being under C, being permitted to uh, run unrestrained at large um, uh, is also uh, a violation, but if you're a hunting dog, that does not constitute that. So if a hunting dog is in the process of hunting, then that doesn't constitute that. Okay, that can lead me to, thank you. My second question then is, hang on a second.
um, the section where we talked to, you talked about um, a dog can run free for exercise. I think it was where you described the hunting dog. Where did that go? Sorry. Maybe somebody else can find it for me. Where the hunting dog is discussed. Okay, well, I can see it at, um, on page three, another section where it says, at large, um, a dog that is off premises of the owner, and so on, uh, needs to be under physical control. Um, when we look at the description of the conservation land and the trails at Pine Meadow Brook, I'm pretty sure that it does say that the dog needs to be under voice control or on a leash. Is that gonna be acceptable with this new bylaw? Um, it, it is not going to be. Um, dogs have got to be you know, on a leash unless they are a uh, hunting dog in the process of hunting. Okay, I do see it here now. Um, I'm not sure how we would define a hunting dog. You mean actively hunting? Uh, hunters who have hunting dogs know what that means. I mean, it's a, it's a hunting dog. They, okay. they assist in the process of hunting, whether it be birds or flushing out other okay. animals. So I think I'd like to um, ask if it's possible um, to make a, a small motion, and I'm wondering if this is legal first before, so I don't know if we need an attorney opinion, but for that letter, this is on page five, letter C. Um, it says, being permitted to run unrestrained at large, the running of hunting dogs, certified service dogs, and search and rescue dogs shall not con con consti constitute a public disturbance here and here under. The exercising of other dogs which are under physical control, and I would like to add, or voice control at P Pine Meadow Pond or other um, conservation trails in the town of Ayer. Um, so in other words, we're expanding that definition so that people who own dogs and want their dog to exercise comfortably and not have to have their dog on a leash all the time have the right to do that um, on conservation land that has already been designated so. So is, am I allowed to make a motion to make that change? How, and if so, could you help me on how to do that? First of all, it should be, any amendment should be yeah, in writing. Yes, so I was gonna say, do you have this in writing? An amendment but in I don't writing. Know if it can be specific I have it on my sheet here. I hand wrote it. You want me to bring Will that be acceptable to you? Submit, but is it okay to? So I would defer a question if it could be specific yes. to the land. Thank you. I just want. I'm going to... As long as I have something in writing. I'm having a hard time hearing you. I'm sorry. Chief. Is it clear what it is? It is. It is? We have to have it in writing. Any amendment needs to be in writing. Yes, I understand. So I need it written. It's, yes. And you have it and it's clear in writing. Yes. Okay. Mr. Mr. Moderator? We have a, yes? I believe town council. Yes, thank you. Okay. Yes. Okay. Uh, good evening through Sorry, you, Mr. Mr. Moderator. Yes. Um, so the motion does need to be in writing do you have that yes we have that okay and um can you read the the full motion as it's been written Would you mind that Thank you. under public disturbance uh, c being permitted to run unrestrained at large the running of hunting dogs certified service dogs and search and rescue dogs shall not constitute a public disturbance here under the exercising of other dogs which are under the physical control or vo voice control of their owner or keeper at Pine Meadow Pond Trails shall not constitute a public disturbance here under, providing permission of the landowner has been obtained. And that landowner would be the town of Air. Okay. I'm sorry? And the landowner in that case would be the town of Air. Okay, then. Okay. That's not written. So we do have a motion that's in writing, sir. Okay, and has that motion been seconded? I have not asked for a second okay. yet, sir. Thank you. I wanted to make sure we had it in writing, so. Gotcha. Point of order. Yes, sir. It does not say town of air. So if it I don't think it needs to. It's implied. It needs to. Writing. 
I think we should add it. Okay. Do you consider that friendly to the amendment? I, I don't think that an individual dog owner needs to ask permission from the town of Air because it is in our bylaws already that the Pine Meadow Pond trails are um, specifically, al you're allowed to walk dogs with voice control or a leash. I'm not fighting the point, Lori. I'm just making sure your amendment is specific. That's okay. why I'm only asking if you want to specifically write that. I'm not I, I giving any pushback yeah, to the I don't one. think it's necessary. She doesn't want to include it. Don't include it? Don't include it, please, okay. as, it, as it's written then. Do we have a second? We have a second. Any discussion? Yes. On the I amendment, comment. please. I, uh, Mr. Moderator, I have yes, some discussion on the amendment. I'm sorry, Chief Gill. Yes, Chief. Um, so as we're talking about the town of Airland that falls under the purview of the Conservation Commission, uh, I would strongly not tie the hands of the Conservation Commission who has specific uh, authority over the, this land. Um, so that's uh, what I have on this. So we, you know, whatever we're going to do here, we could possibly be in conflict with the well, Conservation you, Commission. I'm, through the moderator. Could you please explain what you mean by tie the hands of? The Conservation Commission has already passed this. So the, the Conservation Commission are the ones who have the authority over conservation land um, by making this rule. And I'm not sure if this is an informal rule, uh, a formal rule. I don't have that information now. But what we would be doing by this would be doing something that could possibly be going counter to what the Conservation Commission wants of their lands. To the moderator, is there anybody here from the Conservation Commission that can speak to that? I believe we have someone coming forward, Ms. Nearing. Mr. Schmallenberger. Good evening, everyone. John Schmallenberger, Air Conservation Commission. Uh, it is not our bylaw. It is just a policy. Thank you. Any other comments on the amendment? Yes. Um, Jillian Loker, Three Curly Circle. Thank you. Um, I have been attacked by a dog under so-called voice control, and I would urge this amendment to fail, and uh, I would urge us to go with the original wording here as per the state. Thank you. Thank you. Susan Tordella, Five Hedgeway. Through the moderator, have there been complaints? I don't know if she complained when she was attacked by a dog under voice control. Have there been complaints about dogs on public land attacking or being a problem or a nuisance? Chief, can you speak to that? I can speak in generality that we have had complaints um, of uh, dogs under voice control attacking people. Um, and that's whether I, I would say that it doesn't matter whether it's on public land, private land, or whatever. If a dog is on voice control and decides to act on its own, then there's no stopping it, which I believe is what the, uh, uh, um, I don't know if we caught her name, but what she's referring to, I believe I'm familiar with that incident. So through the moderator, that means all this open space, the dogs, unless they're a hunting dog or a service dog has to be on a leash. Correct. Thank you. Mr. Diskin? And my question was, first of all, for clarity, didn't you tell us that these, this adoption of the bylaw or change to the recommended change to our local bylaw was in accordance with the state general laws? Correct. Can we turn around and change this language if we're well, going to the state if this is their language? Can we even amend this it? State. That's my first question. My second comment is I've also had a situation where someone, dogs were running up and down a trail, maybe 50 or 80 feet ahead of their owner. Now I didn't put it in a complaint officially, but that was enough to scare me. And then the owner showed up and said they were under voice control. So I, I, I disagree with the whole concept of voice control. And I don't want to take a shot at changing language that's already in a state regulation, if that's the case. Mr. Moderator. Yes. Uh, some Chief clarification Gill. on this. Um, so the, the, the section that we're talking about here is not out of state law. This is the rules and regulations that we have um, uh, uh, created in, from other, uh, from other uh, bylaws. 
that we've seen. Thank you, Chief. Another comment, sir? Yes, uh, Mike Gallard, 34 Fletcher Street. Um, earlier, we stated about the um, nuisance for a dog um, that has been deemed uh, that has been deemed uh, a nuisance, and the the, the fines were 100 amended to. 100. Excuse me, sir. At this point in time, we're discussing the amendment only. We'll get back to the main motion in a moment. Thank you. On this side. Scott Murray, one Sandy Way. Um, just two comments, um, uh, and then one, hopefully, motion. The um, the motion as uh, the amendment as proposed is extremely confusing in the sense that it's inserting it into the second part of this sentence by trying to carve out one specific area, and I think it takes away from the main body of what the purpose of the sentence was. So I would urge that we do not approve it um, as currently moved because I think it's extremely confusing. Um, not, the second part is, how is one to determine what is appropriate uh, voice command or being under voice control? Who determines that? What's the definition of that if we were to consider this amendment? And um, finally, if uh, I, I would like to sort of move, the, move this at some point here. I'm sorry, I missed the last part. Can of we move this question? Move the question. Thank yeah. you. Question has been moved. All Thank you. So we have a vote on the suggested amendment. amendment. All in favor? Aye. Opposed? No. no. The amendment does not carry. Back to the main motion. Sir, I think you had a question on the main motion you wanted to bring up? Hey, can I ask you to speak into the microphone, please? With Mike Gale at 34 Fletcher Street, um, with regards to the fines being imposed on a dog which has been deemed a nuisance, um, the, uh, under that law, MGL 37, um, the uh, solution for that after a public hearing was um, The authority shall um, either dismiss the complaint or, or deem the dog a nuisance, which, which would result in uh, remedial action to improve or make better the cause of the nuisance, uh, of the nuisance behavior. Um, to uh, add on uh, an amendment with a fine of 100, 200, and it goes on, I think that's uh, excessive. I believe if if the first offense happens, it should stay with the Mass General Law, which was, and I, which was what I just uh, described under uh, um, 150, 140, 157B, um, for as far not a dangerous dog, but a, a dog that has been de uh, deemed a nuisance. But I, I, I would totally object to the uh, the fines that go afterward. Thank you. Yes, sir. Uh, yeah, Darren Woods, 142 Washington Street. And so my, it's a question um, on page four uh, of the article, this public nuisance part, it's all struck, you know, the strike through there. Uh, in, in particular, uh, the language, when it persistently and continually barks, is what I'm, my question is. That, that, that specific language doesn't seem to be carried over into the public disturbance part. My old eyes might have missed it or something. I just didn't know if you could comment on that. No, absolutely. So the, uh, the public nuisance part of that is actually found in the general law um, where it, all of that language is taken from. Thank you. Thank you, Chief. Ms. Conley. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Um, Chief, I commend you. Uh, Ms. Conley, oh. just once, can you say your name in the address, oh, please? Oh, thank you. Sorry. Pauline Conley, Cambridge Street. Thank you, Chief. Commend you for updating this bylaw. Um, I struggled with the public nuisance language being stricken until I went back and read it from first word. And I did, uh, went to the general law today. There's, I don't know how many dozens of pages from 136 to 174. But I 
printed out just 136A, the definitions. And I would like to suggest no amendments, but once this uh, bylaw is adopted and approved by the Attorney General, if it would be within your consideration to at least list 136A along with the bylaw on the town website so residents don't have to go hunting for this because I know how to find it, you know how to find it, a lot of us know how to find it, but everybody doesn't. And I think everybody deserves to be able to find the definitions, especially that of nuisance dog, since most of that language has been stricken from the original, and the, also the definition of dangerous dog, which is also not in the new bylaw. So if we could add those 20 to 25 definitions, at least to the attachment, I think that would benefit the public greatly. Thank but you thank you very much, you and I point. totally support this change. Thank you. Thank you. Other comments or questions? Seeing none, we're going to vote on the article. Article 3. All in favor? Aye. Aye. <clears throat> Opposed? The article, pa article 3 passes. Article 4. Bylaw Amendment, Chapter 265, Transient Merchants. Similar to the last article. Absent any objections, I shall dispense with the reading of this article as it appears in the warrant. Chief Gill, second Mr. act. Mr. Moderator. Thank you. May I make the motion, sir? Yes, please. All right. I move that the town vote to amend Chapter 265, Transient Emergence, of the general bylaws of the town as printed in the warrant. Second. Thank you, Mr. Hood, and thank you, Mr. Copeland. Chief? Mr. Moderator. Um, again, this is, uh, like, as he said, uh, this is part two of uh, some recommended, uh, a recommended bylaw uh, uh, amendment. Um, so what we were, again, here, the goal of this was to modernize and uh, streamline the transient merchants bylaw and to add a, uh, a portion of this, uh, which was uh, something that has been on my mind and, and through a citizen uh, who uh, kind of uh, brought it to my attention. So one of the, uh, one of the things that uh, we want to, uh, to, to highlight in this is um, to talk about the application and investigation fee. So right now, um, if somebody wants to come in for, and we only have a one year permit, uh, for a, uh, they come in, they fill out a simple form, and they pay $5. Um, that gives them access to the town of air for one year. Um, the, the, there's an, uh, the application itself uh, gets processed by our office manager, um, who then passes it on to either myself or the deputy chief, and we conduct an investigation into the, the character and background of the, the person. And that could, uh, depending on you know, what needs to get done, um, that could take upwards of uh, approximately a half hour. Um, seems like a short amount of time, but if you get enough of them, um, we've all had our solar companies knocking on our doors um, and uh, home repairs, uh, you know, and, and they, they tend to come in a, a wave. Um, so we could spend uh, at some point uh, an hour or two uh, processing a batch of applications. So we felt it prudent that uh, an, ap uh, 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 an application and background investigation fee just on our part uh, was warranted. Um, what we also wanted to do, uh, in, and, I, in, and I have seen this in, in uh, bylaws around the Commonwealth, is have a, uh, a, a structure of how long does a company want to be in town. Um, some companies are only going to be in town for one day. They're just going to want to do one thing. Um, and for, you know, for that kind of process, you know, it, it, uh, I'm recommending a fee structure uh, as we have up above. So for a one day permit, $5 I'm recommending is what it be set. Um, if, if a company wants to be in town for one week, uh, that per, and you can see them up here, one month and one year. Um, and uh, you know, we're, we're not in the business to make money, but what happens in, in uh, with these is we are constantly um, going out, verifying uh, the, the permits that are out there, whether they're active or not. Um, and so this kind of 
recoups for the town the services that the police department has to go out and do and verify with the uh, transient merchants. Um, we're also shifting the uh, yearly permits. Right now they go from April to May. Um, I, I don't know why we adopted that whenever we did, but I'm just uh, recommending that we shift that to a calendar year. The, uh, the yearly permits are from January to uh, December 31st. And if a company comes in and they want to be in town for several months, um, they will get a yearly permit, but the uh, price will be prorated um, for the expiration date uh, in December. Uh, the other thing that we want to do is, uh, the, in, in the current bylaw, it was a little bit all over the place um, and, kind of, and frankly didn't make sense. Uh, so we clarified the application investigation periods to five business days. Um, and uh, we also wanted, and this is the kind of the big one that I wanted to talk about, um, is the no solicitation list. I got it on quotes because uh, I think that's what we call it here. So uh, what, I, what I'm proposing is for the protection of our residents who don't want to have people knocking on their doors is to be uh, opt to go into a no solicitation list where you contact the police department in some form or fashion We'll develop that if this is approved. And you will be on a list. And every time that a solicitor comes into town, we will give them the most updated version of this list. And violating part of that, violating that would be one of the, uh, one of the ways that you could uh, uh, be in violation of the bylaw and, and, and be fined for this. Um, you know, so we're, we're envisioning a list that's, you know, constantly, uh, you know, being added to or subtracted as if people move out of town. But we're going to, you know, try to really make it uh, an accessible document where people can, you know, uh, somehow get in touch with us. Um, you know, I'm thinking off the top of my head, whether it be a phone call or some sort of web form uh, through the uh, town's IT department. Um, we also wanted to add language for the chief to revoke permits for cause. So right now, uh, if we have a uh, solicitor in town that we're getting calls on, that they're aggressive, that they're uh, you know, being forceful, or th they're just not taking no, um, we have to have a hearing on that. And we have to have, you know, get them a piece of paper, have a hearing. And then after that hearing, then the, the, they can um, then be uh, removed from town. What this bylaw, is, this change is proposing is that for cause, if we uh, are confronted with such a solicitor that we can revoke the permit and then there is an appeal process to the, to the hearing authority, which would be the select board. Um, and that would be in a, in, a, in, a, in a quick turnaround period. But what it does is it gives us the ability to control who's on our doorstep. Um, we also uh, uh, wanted to, I wanted to kind of uh, make sure that our, and I had some different language in our first proposal and then after uh, legal counsel we, we kind of really uh, clarified it, was we wanted to make sure that uh, the, the kids in town still had the ability to do fundraisers and go door-to-door door to door and things like that. So we just made it uh, clear here that under 18 who aren't associated with a for-profit uh, organization in the town of Air that they can um, still do that. Um, and the only profit organization that they can do it for is if they're uh, selling newspapers. We don't want to take that out of take that out of their hands either. And uh, this is the latest adjustment that we made, and this came uh, as advice from uh, council as well. So as towns have been uh, modifying their transient merchant bylaws or solicitors bylaws, um, that the window for operation has been. Um, has been questioned and some communities had uh, very small windows, others had restrictive windows that weren't really conducive to business. Um, this time frame seems to be the time frame that the Attorney General is accepting without any issues. Right now we're at 8 a.m. to 6 p.m. Um, and this proposal is going from uh, 9 a.m. to 9 p.m. And I believe that's the presentation, Mr. The presentation, Moderator. Thank you, Chief. Any questions or comments? Yeah, Frank Macklin, uh, Groton Harvard Road. Um, Chief, the um, the language about exempting minors 
is that exempting them from getting a permit or from, I mean, would you be aware that the miners are going about town? I, I guess I'd like to know that you are aware of everybody who's roaming about town, going door to door. So that's what the permitting process hopefully does, is we know who's in town going door to door. So what about the miners? Will they have, they don't have to buy a permit or do, um, do you, they so, get a permit from you? That so that, you know, that's a, that's a great question. And I, I believe that my thought is that they are exempt from the process itself. Um, you know, I don't feel that it would be appropriate to, you know, charge the high school band, uh, you know, whatever the, the fee is there, you know, $50, you know, to, you know, go through the month of whatever we're in October to, to do that. So I think my, my thought is that it's exempting them from the, this process. I guess I'm concerned. Okay. I, I think, you know, there's too many scams going on and I could bring in a bunch of 17 year olds representing some profit organization. And uh, so to be clear, this is an, um, so they can't be associated with a profit organization. So if they're a 17 year old selling solar, yeah. then they're not, this, they're not exempt from this. This is really focused for our, our, our kids in town who are doing fundraisers for the school, for youth activities, Boy Scouts, things like that. And I'd like to see that they have something from you that says they're in fact from the Boy Scouts. This is a fundraiser that, yeah. yep, we're aware of, the town is aware of. Not just somebody roaming about town saying, I'm a Boy Scout, can you, uh, And my other comment would be on the uh, allowable times. I think uh, 9 a.m. to dusk would be a better, uh, a, a, a better use of the time. I hear what you're saying. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Gugino? Uh, Jess Gugino, Mountain View Avenue. Uh, my question is, when you issue a permit, say it's a solar company that has 20 people going door to door, as a homeowner, answer the door, can I ask to see a permit from that individual solicitor? Absolutely. So every representative of a company will have to carry a copy of that permit? Correct. Okay. Yeah, and that, uh, I believe that's in here as well, that they have to have that displayed. Okay. And that's a great question. And just to clarify for everybody in town, if we have a group that come in that, are, that, that want to sell a product, it's not just the business that has to get uh, vetted through us. It's every individual that is going for that business through town. And we've had circumstances where we've had, you know, half of the, half of the crew didn't make the cut. And then the other half, you know, were able to, you know, continue on. So. Okay, thank you. Susan Tordella, Hedgeway. So could I, if I get on this no solicitation list, would that include keeping uh, under E, activity for religious, political, or public policy purposes, or is it only for the profit-making organizations that would leave me alone? Um, we would hand it out to everybody. Um, we don't, you know, if you, uh, I, I guess we would hand it out to everybody. So um, these people, if they're coming for religious reasons, have to register through you? No, they're, they're exempt from that. And why are insurance, uh, through the moderator, sorry, why are insurance, insurance companies exempt? I believe they have scams and they are for profit. I, I, think, I, I believe it's in statute, but um, I think we're checking, possibly. Please wait. Sorry. Lori Nearing, one more quick question. Uh, can wait, Lori, please wait for a moment. I think we're oh, trying I'm to get sorry. an answer to Mr. Della's question. I apologize. Yeah, it, the, the running thought is that it's in statute. They're licensed by the state. Um, so it, if we find it, we can, we'll, we'll let, uh, We'll let the group know here. Thank you. Ms. Nearing? Uh, just one more clarification. If you have the solar company that's coming in with 20 people, 
does each person have to pay the fee, or is the company paying one fee for their 20? Every person has to, every person has to pay a fee. Okay, so that could be a fair amount of money. Um, and the other clarification is, um, an example that I was wondering about is with my organization, the environmental group PACE, um, if we did door-to-door -door, um, outreach to uh, share information, would that fall under this requirement and would we be required to pay a fee per person if so? So this is a nonprofit organization volunteering in air. Yeah, I'm, I'm looking at uh, section, uh, the, the section that deals with the religious, charitable, and patriotic okay. and philo philanthropic organizations. Um, I'm believe, I, I would say that it would somehow fall into this. Let's remember what we're, tr we're, what we're really trying to do here with this bylaw. It, you know, it is to protect people in town from people coming in out of, from out of town. Okay, thank you. Another comment or question over here? Yeah. Mr. Rick, Adi? Rick Adi, Oak Ridge Drive. I would concur that the time of nine o'clock for most of the year is after dark. That's a danger. Um, so I, I, I would uh, agree that dusk or sunset would be a, a better time. Any further questions or comments? Pauline Conley, Cambridge Street. Chief, um, one thing that I don't see with respect to Article 4 is a reference to the general laws like we had in Article 3. Um, I'm not sure if there is one, and I didn't look today, so I just want to throw that one out there. But with respect to the hours, having been the um, recipient, I should say, of a solicitor at five o'clock in the afternoon on a bright, sunny summer day a few years ago, um, who could not produce a permit and turned out to have a warrant for his arrest, I don't think anything after dark for any solicitor should be allowed. I don't have anything to write with. I can't make a motion in writing, but I hope someone will and at least propose the dusk because dusk will be different depending on the time of year. Um, I don't want anyone to suffer, not suffer, because I didn't suffer. I was very rewarded by the department. They all showed up, lights blazing. Um, but I, I thank you. definitely would like Thank to you. know that others don't have to experience what I did. Mr. Moderator. I'm sorry, Mr. Pompeo, I couldn't tell who was talking. Mr. Moderator, Robert Pompeo, the town manager. Um, just a point of information, I know the chief didn't um, mention this in the presentation and maybe town council can speak to it. On the issue of the, the timeline for the solicitation, we originally had, we didn't have the 9 a.m. to 9 p.m. It was what sort yeah, of Ms. Conley and others six. have mentioned. We were advised from town council that there is several standing case law where this has been challenged and has not has been upheld in court to be the nine to nine. And this has to go to the attorney general for review and she does have the authority to amend it and it is generally amended back to as we have it in the bylaw. I, not to speak for the chief, but from my perspective, I agree with all of the points that have been made about changing it to dusk and so forth, but I just want to advise that there was several case law throughout the Commonwealth that, it, that has been shot down, and the Attorney General has historically, who has the legal authority to edit the bylaw, has changed it, changed it back. Thank you, Mr. Pont Uh Ms. Gugino? Uh, Jess Gugino, Mountain View Avenue. Um, Based on what Pauline was saying, and I agree, I would just as soon make this modification to dusk and if the Attorney General turns it back to 9 a.m. while well, we tried. So I would propose um, amending the bylaw language to, for that line, modified allowed times 9 a.m. to dusk. And I do have it written down. 
Could you please bring it forward? I, I just wrote, I wrote almost the same thing. <laughs> well, we have, we have Ms. Gugino's actually on the floor right now, Pauline, so. That's fine. Thank you. We don't have a second yet. We're going, to, we're going to make clear we have it written, and we can remind people what it is, and then we'll go to the second. Thank you. Mr. Moderator, I tried to copy the language directly from the article as best I could. Thank I you. think Ms. Copeland has figured out what I wrote. Yeah, I, I think you. Susan's got an idea, so. Would you please read the amendment as you have it? Uh, no permittee under this, but this is on page 14. Um, no permittee under this bylaw shall sell, peddle, or solicit between the hours of 9 a.m. to dusk or on Sundays and legal holidays unless invited to do so by the owner or occupant of any private residence in the town. I'm sorry. Point, point of order, the, the, the times, you can't say no permit T and then the, the allowable hours are 9 a.m. to dusk. The way the, this is written is, is reversed because it begins at 9 p.m. to 9 a.m. that they're not permitted. So it should be from dusk to 9 a.m. in the amendment. So they want the change it back to dusk. So it's between the hours of dusk. I understand, yeah. but it was no. written. It was written backwards. Okay. Yeah. Do you want me to reread it? <laughs> no permittee under this bylaw shall sell, peddle, or solicit between the hours of dusk and 9 a.m. or on Sundays and legal holidays unless invited to do so by the owner or occupant of any private residence in the town. Do we have a second? Second. I think it's been seconded. Any discussion on the amendment? Again, I'd speak in favor of it, and I would like to know the process. Um, if this is passed, uh, and the, the whole um, article is passed, what's the timetable for going to the Attorney General? Um, and I would intend to um, write the Attorney General's office um, to make our point um, that 9 p.m. Is, is much too late. And that should not just be an automatic kickback. Um, and, and others could do the same. Thank you. Mr. Um, moderator. Mr. Moderator. There, there was, yeah, um, please. Mr. Moderator, I, uh, Attorney Corbo has uh, just some information for the uh, body. Please, Attorney Corbo. Thank you to you, Mr. Moderator. Um, so. In reviewing, just for, so everybody understands, because this is a bylaw amendment, it first has to go to the Massachusetts Attorney General uh, for review for consistency with state and constitutional laws. Um, the Attorney General has a period of 90 days to conduct that review, um, subject to certain extensions that might be granted. Um, in the course of her review, the Attorney General can approve the entirety of the, the bylaw, she can disapprove the entirety of the bylaw, or she can disapprove only portions. Um, in previous instances, um, in reviewing similar bylaws, the Attorney General has looked at case law from the federal district court in which a federal court held that bylaws limiting solicitation to certain daylight hours were unconstitutional. So the, the risk that you run here is that um, if this goes to the Attorney General and is disapproved, then you, what you get back is a bylaw with no time standards in it whatsoever. Um, and it appears that in previous circumstances, the Attorney General has expressed concern over these limitations of, that are somewhat vague because dusk doesn't have a set definition, as someone already pointed out, it's different at different times of the, the year. Um, and so here you have a, a set specific time frame 
that everybody can look at and can understand, um, and which we believe is consistent with um, case law concerning the amount of reasonable time that solicitors need to have in order to be able to exercise their First Amendment rights. Thank you, Attorney. Cor Attorney, <clears throat> excuse me, Attorney Corbo. Mr. Moderator. Yes, Ms. Livingston. So, just to clarify, because I'm a little concerned, and, and I'm not, I'm not saying that you're giving us incorrect information, because I know you are giving us correct information. However, come, I, I, I question that the solicitor has more constitutional rights to come to my home at 9 p.m. than I do to say, no, you're not going to, and be able to put in a bylaw that evidently the body would like, and, but we're violating their constitutional rights? Something seems a little messed up there. Just want to throw that out there. So I agree. Hey. Personally, I agree with, you know, the Attorney General should maybe watch the meeting so that they can also hear what we're saying, too. But Thank you. Mr. Corbo, would you like to comment? Uh, through you, Mr. Moderator. I'm not sure if that was a real question or not, but, um, you know, it is up to the body to, to decide and to, to make a decision. Um, and, you know, as I said before, the risk is that the um, attorney general would disapprove this particular section, and in which case there would be nothing to prevent you from coming back here and putting a different time restriction on there. Um, in other circumstances, I've seen the attorney general give what, the, what she calls a caution to say that this bylaw has to be applied consistently with the Constitution. So. Um, I, I agree, you know, with Ms. Livingston that, you know, it's the body that gets to decide and it's up to you to, to make a judgment here and then, you know, the Attorney General can look at the legality of that. Obviously, I am not advocating against this amendment in any way. Um, I'm just sort of passing on what my experience has been, but it is up to you to decide how you want to proceed and at this point, again, the risk seems rather minimal in that. Um, the worst case scenario is it would get sent back to you and you'd have another, another shot at it. Thank you. Um, I lost track of who came down first. Let me start with my left. Fred Meshner, 21 Prospect Street. Um, what's the magic number nine? Why is that uh, all of a sudden constitutional? What about eight? What about seven? What about 12? What about midnight? Uh, why, why is nine o'clock the magic hour that makes it so that we're not uh, doing something unconstitutional? Uh, to answer the why, I, I don't know why that seems to be uh, what's been accepted. Um, what if we said eight? Is it the time or is it the dusk that's the problem? I, I, I apologize. I, I, I can't I, I answer the question. I think you've asked the question the multiple general. times and the chief has answered. He does not know the answer. Well, does, does the uh, attorney, does the counsel know the answer to that? Mr. He's Carlo, the one that brought up the constitutional, constitutionality of it. Thank you. Through, through you, Mr. Moderator. So. Um, what, what the court has looked at in the past were communities that, pro hip, that only allowed canvassing and solicitation um, during daylight hours or prohibited it after sunset. And the court held that legitimate municipal interests of reducing crime and public annoyance can be better served by measures less intrusive than such overly restrictive time limitations. In addition, um, courts have found that the term dusk um, is vague and that it has a lack of character and raises the specter of both chilling effect and discriminatory enforcement. These are not my words. These are words that were written by the Attorney General looking at a, at a prior bylaw. Um, so here, you know, you're looking at uh, having a period of time of 12 hours a day that allows for um, this type of door-to-door -door solicitation. Um, I can't stand here and tell you that, you know, 9 p.m. is fine, but 8 p.m. is not. Um, however, it does appear that less descriptive standards like dusk or sunset are more problematic. So Yeah, it sounds like the problem is the, the uh, unclear nature of dusk. So let's make it 6 p.m. Excuse, excuse me. 
We currently have an amendment we have to take care of. Thank you. Ms. Gugino. Um, I was going to make a friendly amendment to my own amendment <laughs> motion to uh, change this from dusk to 7 p.m. <laughs> um, so we could we could do this. I'll do it. I'll do it to seven because I think that allows for if you do four o'clock. I would guess that the state could come back and say, well, that uh, disenfranchises residents from having their door rung by a wonderful solicitor after they get home from work. So it seemed to me 7 p.m. was is reasonable. That's what I would amend my previous motion to change it to no permittee under this bylaw shall sell, peddle, or solicit between the hours of 7 p.m. and 9 a.m. I'm going to turn to the attorney for a quick question. We have an amendment that's been moved and seconded. We're discussing it. Now the author would like to change the amendment. Friendly to myself. Yes. Uh, the, <laughs> through you, Mr. Moderator, um, if that Amend, that amendment is second, it seconded in your discretion, you can allow the mover to substitute the first amendment for the second. Seconded. seconded. <laughs> That's half the battle, right there. <laughs> thank you, attorney. I was thinking we just say no to the first one and rewrite the agenda, um, but thank you So should much. I bring for... this up with the yes, change please. of desk and then at the same time move the question? You can't move the question as okay, our I'll bring this up. past moderator said. Well, we, need to uh, we have people standing. Jim, I'm sorry. Yes, Mr. James. Moderator, through you, I'd like to ask a question of the chief. Chief, since you have presented the idea of a no solicitation list, would it be possible for the homeowners to say no solicitors after dark, after six o'clock? or at another time, and then we solve the problem with both the bylaw and a list that says to the peddler, merchant, or whomever, don't go to that house after six o'clock. That's, an That's my suggestion. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. O'Connor. That's an interesting way of getting it in on the discussion of the amendment. <laughs> I'm sorry, I, yes. Um, I'm willing to go with I, what, what I, the decision I, I, I'm is. I'm sorry, Mr. Roddy, we do have a move the question from the... Um, right, and uh, I was standing before that was made, and it was made from the floor, not from a mic. Thank you. Uh, in my opinion, and, and of course, this goes back to Robert's rules, once the body accepts an um, amendment and it's been seconded, it belongs to the body. So I would disagree that you can do friendly amendments. Thank you. Move the question. Thank you. On the amendment... Which one? I'm going to ask the clerk to read it for us again. Thank okay. you. Ms. Copeland, would you please read the final version of the amendment? No permittee under this bylaw shall sell, peddle, or solicit between the hours of 7 p.m. and 9 a.m. or on Sundays and legal holidays unless invited to do so by the owner or occupant of any private residence in the town. Thank you. Voting on the amendment only. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? The amendment carries. Back to the article, Article 4. Do you have any, any other comments on the article or questions? Seeing none, all in favor of Article 4? Aye. Opposed? Article 4 passes unanimously. <clears throat> Excuse me. Article 5, street acceptance, curly circle. To see if the town will vote to accept the layout of Curly Circle as a public way, the meets and bounds of which are on file in the office of the town clerk, as previously laid out by the select board, and to authorize the select board to acquire by gift, purchase, or eminent domain a fee, interest, or easement in such public way, and any and all easements related thereto, and further, to authorize the select board to enter into all agreements and take all related actions necessary or appropriate to carry out this acquisition on such terms and conditions as the select board deems appropriate or take any action there on or in relation thereto. Mr. Moderator. Ms. Livingston. I move that the town vote to accept the layout of Curly Circle as a public way as printed in the warrant and read by the moderator. Second. Moved and seconded. And thank you very much, Mr. Copeland. We have a short presentation if you would like.
Ask Dan Van Scalquit to come up. Thank you. Director Von Skelquick. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Good evening. I'm Dan Van Skelquick, DPW Director. Um, so just real briefly on the street acceptance of Curly Circle. Next slide. Thanks, Cindy. So um, it's a subdivision road which has recently been completed. It's off of Littleton Road. I have a map on another slide. And um, it's substantially complete. There's a couple punch item lists that the developer was not able to get to. And to address those, uh, we've entered into a memorandum of understanding the select board has with the developer, assuming that this passes town meeting, to um, finish the street lights, which are partially finished, but he's having trouble getting the uh, fixtures in this day and age. It's uh, typical of that. And also um, some drainage improvements that we, we um, just recently became aware of um, behind a few lots. It's uh, just some road drainage from Littleton Road is getting onto the subdivision, causing impacts during uh, heavier storms. So part of the MOU is that the... Um, there's a surety held of $24,750, so, um, so we have that cash there, and the developer has to complete these items in order for that to be released. And the the, this vote by town meeting, if, if it is a positive vote to accept the street, it's not the final part of street acceptance. Um, as you can tell the way the article's written, it needs, the street would need to be acquired by the select board. And so they have 120 days from town meeting to acquire that. So, the developer needs to complete these items before the, the, the street is um, acquired or else we would not recommend acquisition. So, um, Next slide, image of Curly Circle, it's off of Littleton Road. Uh, you can see in the red here, it's tough, but... Um, and final slide is just the subdivision plan. One more slide, Cindy, there you go. Street acceptance plan. Okay. And Thank you very um, much for Any questions? Comments? Seeing none. All in favor of Article 5? Aye. 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 Opposed? Article 5 passes unanimously. I'd like to ask for a motion to dissolve. So moved. Do we have a second? Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Good night, all. Thank you very much.